characteristics of life and living systems. So you might end up with um, learning systems that whose measure of success, just as in healthy ecosystems, is holistic well-being and everything that comes with that, mutual relationships, diversity as the uh, special sauce of, of secret sauce of success, and regeneration, uh, regenerativity. In other words, creating the conditions for more life um, and uh, much more uh, diffuse kind of of power within that. So I'm going to stop there because I've gone beyond my uh, time limit already, but I have more slides in case um, anybody would like to know more about what we've done. Well, my curiosity has surely peaked and we will definitely make some time during the conversation to hopefully um, dig into some more of your slides and see some more of those examples. Thanks, Tara. I can't wait to hear from everybody else. Thank you. So I'm just going to introduce our next speaker now. We have Michelle Blanchett. Um, and Michelle is an educational consultant that infuses startup strategies into professional learning so that teachers are empowered to bring change making, social innovation, and SDGs into their work. After teaching social studies in both the US and Switzerland, she founded the Educators Lab, which supports teacher driven solutions to educational challenges. And Michelle is the co author of the Startup Teacher Playbook and Preventing Polarization 50 Strategies for Teaching Kids About Empathy, Politics, and Civic Responsibility. She has worked with organizations like PBS Education and Ashoka, and occasionally blogs for Edutopia. A graduate of IE University in Madrid, she is a part of the Global Shaper community of the World Economic Forum and has presented at numerous events, including South by Southwest and TEDx. Her focus, agility in education, gamifying civics, and green career pathways. So Michelle, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. I'm going to try to get my slides up quickly. Um... And as usual, my computer seems to be shutting down when under pressure. Okay. Great. Am I sharing? It is not. Sorry. Yes, that looks good, Michelle. Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and share like this then. Um, yeah, so my introduction has been said, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've done specifically related to sustainability and um, working with schools on this. Um, so one of the first ways that we kind of got involved with sustainability is simply through um, our work uh, with the Startup Teacher Playbook. So as I mentioned, I'm a former teacher. I noticed we had a lot of room in the professional learning space uh, to uh, be more agile and what I wanted to see was a space where we could be supported to uh, work on ideas that we believe to matter. Um, therefore, uh, fortunately, I've had a lot of experience in the in the social startup world uh, and that enabled me to see things like, like the business model canvas and lean startup, design thinking, etc. So we went ahead and created some of our own um, variations on this so that we could create a space for educators uh, to work on how they might do things like bring the SDGs in the classroom or create opportunities for students um, uh, to work on initiatives with sustainability. Um, for us, we've noticed one of the biggest challenges is just space, time, and support. Um, teachers that are already interested in this really just need a chance to, to work through ideas and figure out what's the best way to embed uh, some of these themes into their curriculum in a way that works. Uh, they need a chance to think through how they might leverage community partnerships. Um, I mean, even a field trip. I mean, if you've ever planned one, this is hours of extra time. Uh, so uh, really, that's what we've noticed. And so uh, for us, the this educator canvas is a way to, for teachers. Um, it's just a set of guiding questions so that teachers could think through, you know, what their goals are, what they want to do with students so that they create some sustainable initiatives. Um, and not to say we always get it right, um, but it is a chance for teachers to try. Um, and I think that's what we need right now. I don't think anyone has the solutions. Um, and as Maggie said, I think the key to hopelessness is action and people want to be able to do things. Um, and this is a way as well for teachers to practice active learning and therefore they're more likely to do it with their students. Um, so when they're in power to, uh, you know, materialize their own ideas, uh, they're more likely to take those to the classroom. So that's one concrete way we've kind of gotten started with um, some change maker work and uh, getting people started on their own sustainability journeys. 
Uh, the second thing was um, on this book, Preventing Polarization. This book's really about uh, social emotional learning um, and why we need to think about social emotional learning when we think about civic engagement. Um, I think one of the points or one of, for me, a key purpose of school is to ensure our students um, are engaged citizens. And we can only get so far in our sustainability journeys if we don't vote in leaders who care about this. Um, and I think we really need to make sure that students understand that their voice matters and that their vote matters. Um, and so this is a reason this topic, I think, is really important when we think about sustainability. Um, and by the way, when we talk about social emotional learning, um, I've taught civics, I've taught it in Virginia, which seems to get in the news a lot. Um, and just teaching kids things like the electoral college, they get upset. Um, it, it is an emotional topic. So as much as sometimes you get told to just teach the curriculum, kids have feelings. Uh, so I think that we need to do a better job of, in, of giving kids the opportunity to discuss relevant and real issues, to deal with ambiguity. And um, I showed some things. We tend to use games as a way to help kids be able to practice expressing themselves, communicating, being tolerant to one towards one another, and of course, exploring the issues that matter. And this is where I think sustainability comes into play. Uh, so that's kind of a second way where we've been kind of um, trying to hit and on how we might um, support our students uh, on their sustainability journeys. Uh, and then the final way is uh, a greener future of work. I've been doing a bit of work with Getting Smart. Um, we've also been uh, uh, promoting the work of Generation 180. Um, this is on to a few fronts and I'll cover these three bullet points. So number one, um, the Inflation Reduction Act offered a huge opportunity. I think as schools, we need to ask ourselves if we're contributing to student success, not only in what we teach them, but in how we operate. So I think we have about 10% of schools right now in the US that have converted to solar. Uh, there a lot more, we, we can do a lot more. Um, I think one only 1% 1 have converted over to um, electric buses. I think there's a lot of money to do that. Um, clean infrastructure is great because number one, it enables schools uh, to save money. Uh, so there tends to be a lot lot more buy-in when we talk about how we get started on the sustainability journey. Money tends to talk. Um, the other thing, once the clean infrastructure is there, it can lend itself to more opportunities. So if you're already installing solar panels, it's easier to create curriculum around uh, renewable energy or create a, a CT or a career in technical for those who don't know the acronym, it's career technical education. It's easier to create those kind of opportunities so students get exposed to that. Um, not only does that help students just have an understanding of renewable energy so they might make better consumer choices as adults, uh, but it's also a way um, not only to offer a, a direct career path, um, and I can go on a lot about future jobs. We we already know that green jobs are 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 coming and it's going to, we're going to have exponential growth in quite a few categories. Um, and not only is this though, um, you know, sometimes when we talk about, you know, CTE and solar or, or just green CTE, we might focus on something like solar. Um, but beyond that, uh, companies are asking for this. Um, green skills are gonna disrupt most professions. Uh, so we need to do, make sure that we're ensuring our students have a climate literacy so that they're competitive. So I don't care if they go into banking, nursing, um, I, I mean, most most uh, like if you look at a lot of MBAs, they have a sustainability component. Companies want this; they know they need it, so it's important. Um, and then finally, I think with um, kind of a greener future of work, if we talk about this, is really thinking about community partnerships and what that looks like. Um, it's different in different areas. We were able to host a chat. Um, and it was really interesting in Philadelphia, uh, their energy authority was able to make a connection with uh, Philadelphia Public Schools and they had a CTE program and, you know, it's a way to connect students to those sort of jobs in the future. Whereas we had someone from Denver River Public Schools come and um, they might be getting started on CTE, but as far as like career partnerships, they might not have that yet, but I wanted to note them because um, what was interesting is the reason that sustainability director was hired was because students pushed for it. Um, so when we think about a greener future of work, um, the jobs are there. Uh, so I don't know who starts it. I don't know if we need more, more students and teachers pushing and saying, we need this, we need a sustainability director, we need someone who's going to help ensure that our infrastructure is good that, and that we have um, opportunities to learn about this stuff. Um, 
but uh, the opportunity is there. And I think these conversations are happening and I, I wanted to highlight that. And those are the three main things I'm working on in these areas. So happy to chat further about those. And hopefully I didn't go too over time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. I really appreciate your uh, note that every job can be a green job. And indeed, every job should become a green job and have that, that layer to it. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just go back to my slides again here briefly and introduce our next speaker, who is Manuela Zamora. So Manuela has been the executive director of New York Sunworks which is an award-winning educational nonprofit since 2012. Manuela is a native of Bolivia where she had extensive experience in sustainable development projects. As the director of NY Sunworks, she has worked to provide hands-on sustainability science and climate education for NYC students through the installation and operation of hydroponic science labs and farm classrooms and the accompanying standards-based K-12 curriculum, building over 250 plus public school partnerships across the five boroughs in metropolitan New Jersey. Manuela is a tireless advocate for robust sustainability education for our next generation of science innovators and leaders, most recently sitting on the food policy transition team for New York City Mayor Eric Adams. She has also presented before the U.S. House of Representatives Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition, the World Environmental Education Conference in Prague, and the North America Association for Environmental Education Conference in Tucson. So I'll turn it over to you, Manuela. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here and with the challenge of sharing my screen right now. So I'll, I'll do that first. Uh, I guess this. <laughs> Is it sharing? Oops, share. Hold on. Can you see every, there you go. And I need to go to slides, it, right? It's working. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's working, right? Because I can't see how much I'm sharing. I just see you. All right. So um, uh, New York Sunworks is a uh, not-for-profit organization, as you've heard before, um, that brings hydroponic farming technology into the public school classroom. So um, we enter the classroom and the school community through as a science program, uh, but we bring together uh, in, in sustainability science and climate education. So the goal is that becomes part of the daily instruction and the daily curriculum of every school that we work with. We envision a generation of environmental innovators empowered to create solutions to the climate challenges. Um, as we mentioned before, we started in, uh, um, sorry, 2010 uh, with one uh, program I went too fast. With this first lab, one program uh, at a public school, um, and um, about 12 years later, we're very happy to be in uh, 250 public schools in the five boroughs. Most of our communities are underserved communities. Almost 80% are Title I schools, and um, therefore it's even more relevant to bring science and um, sustainability and climate education to those communities. So we were currently the largest uh, form, foremost comprehensive uh, climate education program in New York City. Uh, we're reaching, we've reached this past year 100,000 students and um, we're going to surpass that this year. We're very happy to reach that goal and we're currently in 250 schools. We'll reach 300 by December. It's happily all funded and we're moving forward to, to reach those communities. We started with the greenhouse classroom model, uh, which is obviously too expensive and not necessarily replicable, but those some of those greenhouses already exist. So therefore we retrofit those spaces and, and turn them into classrooms. But what really works is um, bringing uh, what we call the classroom conversion, transforming in any space into an urban farm with um, commercial level um, technology and uh, providing the students an exposure to different design and different uh, um, type of equipment that is the, um, you know, designed for a specific purposes, vine crops or uh, um, leafy greens or fish farms in this case, et cetera. So it really, uh, the design is really, um, is guided based on the needs of the school, the size of the school, and other aspects of the specific community. 
Uh, this is a great example of how a classroom looks like, and uh, we design in a way that students are em embedded, they are part of the actual farm. And um, with that, uh, um, we provide as um, a comprehensive K-12 science curriculum that meets the science standards. So this subject has um, been discussed throughout the day, how, how, uh, how to make it part of um, how to make it easier for the teacher to teach. So we are at um, training the trainer model. We work with the school teachers and the teachers will pass the, and teach the curriculum to their students. So every element of the classroom really has a connection to, to the science standards. And with that, an extension to basically, why are we doing this? Why are we thinking differently? Why are we bringing this technology into the classroom, why urban farming and, and, and you know hydroponics and all these novelties that were not uh, very known in the past. And that's really the connection to sustainability and more specifically to climate education. Um, so we're not only filling the gaps in science because um, in New York City, and I'm not familiar with other states curriculums, but science is not necessarily mandatory until seventh grade. So it's very important for us to work with those teachers and bring science since kindergarten and introducing these more complex topics and, and connections through the practice of farming. So basically, the students will learn from seed to harvest, and they will make specific connections to the need. So a quick example is first graders will learn about insects. So how about learning about integrated pest management and how ladybugs are beneficial to us and they eat aphids while we're having these, you know, uh, pest invasions in the classroom. So you can picture the endless connections that we find um, every grade. And the curriculum uh, covers a, an entire year per grade. So it's, it's really providing all that the teacher needs to teach in that type of classroom. Um, as you can imagine, we have hundreds of pounds of vegetables available and it's a wonderful byproduct uh, and also very important byproduct of the science program, but really very important to the communities. And um, with that, we developed um, not only, uh, sorry, I'm gonna go back to our harvest program, which is a way to distribute all the all the crops to the communities, to the schools, the, to the students themselves, so they take them home, um, and they uh, we use um, uh, what is called funds of knowledge. So we have an activity, so the students can bring their cultures and 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 um, the funds of knowledge from home into the classroom. We also develop a workforce. Um, uh, development program, a, a, a work for, uh, to bridge, you know, this, this um, learning and these technologies uh, into the, um, into uh, the possibilities for students to, to connect into new careers, all these elements that were discussed and presented already before me. And, um, and within this context, we really see other elements um, in, in the classroom, of course, improve uh, eating just by having access to delicious, fresh and nutritious food, uh, but also very important uh, outcomes in terms of social emotional learning, uh, safe space and, and empowerment for girls uh, participating in STEM, um, uh, among many uh, other, other uh, outcomes that we have uh, in the program. So I'm um, wrapping it up because I'm over time. <laughs> uh, we're very, uh, we're open to new ideas and to continue growing, but we're very happy to have developed this model and, and, and share it with all of you as something that's been working in, in a, such a um, vibrant and also diverse community that we have in, in New York City. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Manuel. I <laughs> So it's so just compelling and inspiring. And um, I just love that you bring the funds of knowledge into how the how the harvests are used so the students mm -hmm. can see a bit of themselves in, in what they're doing and, and have that motivation for that delicious meal that they'll be able to cook at the end of everything. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm gonna share my screen one more time to introduce our last panelist. Um, so finally, we have Catherine Peterson uh, Blanchard. 
She's currently the Assistant Division Director of Professional Services at the Smithsonian Science Education Center. In this role, she leads educational initiatives across the United States and around the world. Catherine works with teachers, schools, districts, and communities to build support for science and STEM education that intersects with social issues and sustainable development, and directs the Network for Emergent Socioscientific Thinking. She is passionate about connecting people who are doing this work across geographic borders, disciplines, and generations. During her time at the SSE, Catherine has led professional development workshops, leadership institutes, and has worked on the development of new initiatives, including the Smithsonian Science for Global Goals project. Prior to joining the SSEC in 2012, Catherine worked in theater production for companies in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Belgrade, Serbia, and was a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Belgrade. She holds a BA in theater and political science from Coe College and an MA in international education from the George Washington University. We're so happy to have you with us, Catherine, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Tara. It's lovely to be here. And thank you to all of our my fellow presenters. It was wonderful to learn a little bit about the work that you do. Um, so I am going to add some visual aids. Can everyone see that? Yes. Does that look ridiculously small to all of you? Does it look okay? All right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so um, as, as Tara mentioned, my name is Catherine Blanchard, um, and I am here at the Smithsonian. Um, and I am assuming some of you have been to the Smithsonian and know that we're a great big institution based in Washington, DC. Um, and uh, we are particularly unique in that we bring together science, art, history, culture, and education um, and catalyze critical conversations and actions around our shared future, um, both as um, Americans here in the United States, but also um, globally in terms of our shared future and life on our sustainable planet, um, or um, some of the other kind of social issues that, that my colleagues around the Smithsonian grapple with as well. Um, the Smithsonian Science Education Center, however, is particularly unique because we're the only group at the Smithsonian that focuses on doing this in the K through 12 or primary and secondary education space. We're focused on transforming education through a lens of science in collaboration with communities around the globe. Um, we promote active inquiry-based K through 12 STEM education and learning. Um, we focus on diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion in STEM. Um, and we advance STEM education for sustainable development um, or STEM for SD, which is the acronym that we use for that at this point in time. So in 2016, as we all learned about the sustainable development goals, we had this opportunity to think about what do we want our shared future to be as an organization, um, as a people, as a globe, um, and what particularly could the Smithsonian Science Education Center bring to that? So in looking at these beautiful 17 messy goals, um, the theme that we saw throughout them is that young people will need an understanding of science in order to help us take action on these. And not only young people, but adults as well. But I happen to work directly with young people. Um, and so in doing that, um, you know, it's not just about being able to know the science, but it's about how you kind of build your mindsets around them. So with that, we built a, a framework called the sustainability mindsets, um, and these are an approach that we take to helping young people really kind of think towards that shared transformative future. So agency and action taking is really the belief that personal and collective action can lead to positive change. Um, our reflection and open mindedness is understanding different perspectives and contexts for knowledge. Relationships and interconnection are focusing on connections between systems, places, people, nature, and times. Um, and then equity and justice is honoring the intrinsic value that all living things, um, of all living things, their identities, and the world around us. Um, and finally, that shared transformative future sits at the center. Together, these four mindsets help to move us towards this idea of a transformative goal of, of a, um, you know, imagined society that's better than the one we have now. And it's not your job or my job necessarily to plot out what that's supposed to look like because it is ever evolving and our young people are part of the drivers that make that a reality. So our approach, um, this graphic looks a little like the last one, but sideways, um, is um, focused on kind of four main areas. One is on co-constructing our Smithsonian Science for Global Goals guides that are aligned to those UN Sustainable Development Goals and use a framework that we call the Global Goals Action Progression to help students really get to the point of being able to take action on big global issues in their own local communities. 
to better support students in, in uh, taking this step. We also provide professional development that supports educators to take a transdisciplinary approach to teaching that aligns to modern student needs that um, also kind of reframes their role as an educator from the sage on the stage who knows all the things to someone who's co-creating, constructing knowledge with their students, who's working to um, you know really think of themselves as a facilitator and not having to have all the answers and also not having to have necessarily all those burdens that Maggie spoke about earlier as well. Um, if you look over on the right side, our, our um, systemic transformation is really focused on collaborating with schools, districts, ministries of education to design education systems that meet student and educator needs now, um, not that are designed for a 19th century population, but instead are really focused on how we, how we move forward um, in, in our education communities. And the last piece of this is the network that brings this all together. So connecting passionate, invested individuals and organizations and catalyzing global conversations about this work um, is uh, you know, a really important piece of, um, of doing this on a global setting, not just in our own, own individualized communities and being able to kind of build that, that empathy that goes beyond just the people that we know on an everyday basis to others around the world. Um, I'm almost done here. So the main kind of piece, uh, the keystone, if you will, of this work are Smithsonian Science for Global Goals guides. These are freely available for download, designed for students ages 11 to 18, that we have seen them used with students as young as five and six. They're um, optimized for accessibility needs. Um, and they're really modularized um, to help uh, help educators be able to kind of take what they need that serves their, their students' needs as well. Um, they feature really great social and emotional supports, um, a focus on uh, themes like resilience, community building, understanding and learning from your, your, um, your ancestors and those who are in your community whom we might not hear from as often. Um, and uh, just to give you kind of a, an idea of the, of the depth and breadth of this work, um, we've reached 2.8 million students since 2016 and 30,000 educators have been trained in 88 countries. Um, and so with that, um, I will turn it back to Tara to, um, to give us a, a little move on to our next phase. Thanks so much, Catherine. That is so inspiring. I know our team will definitely be digging into some of those resources that you have available. And I think there'll be a lot of tie-ins to our work as well. Um, and I know we don't have a ton of time left, and I want to make sure we have time for the for questions from the rest of our participants here. Um, so I'll ask kind of one question that I think applies to all of your work um, to start. And I think, you know, the past couple of years, teachers have just been dealing with so many compounding challenges, shifted learning trajectories, you know, coming out of, of coming out of the pandemic, if we can say that, um, teacher shortage crisis. To Maggie's point, there's, you know, there's so many different initiatives that teachers are trying to juggle, all well-intentioned. So in your work, how do you, what do you find to be some of those key success factors to really help teachers take up some of this work and embed it into their, you know, their core teaching practice? If you can share any examples, we'd love to, to hear a bit more about, about those key success factors. And that's for any, any one of you. Maggie. Yeah, I could go a little bit. Um, I think that um, it would be hard for me to find teachers in a, a more climate impacted area um, than in Puerto Rico. And uh, they are working very, very hard simply to meet all of the expectations, but they're very intensively fragmented from each other, students from nature, you know, the curriculum is divided into different disciplines so that when and if they're teaching about environmental uh, issues or about climate change, it's almost always in a science class. And so students feel that it that they are really not getting, uh, you know, what they what they need. And the teachers feel like they're not doing everything that they could be doing, but they themselves are are traumatized by the situation in which they are teaching. So Here's one of the things that we did that we also did this with recognition that um, teachers themselves may not be comfortable in nature. So, you know, the, that that feeling like, you know, how am I going to do this? Right. Like I have to take my kids outside. <laughs> you know, 
but wait a minute, we live in the city. All of these kinds of, of issues. And, and um, so there's there, there was recognition that, that among the teachers that they really needed more uh, educator learning, even though there are great examples around the world that they could look at. Um, so we invited them, uh, their students actually invited them to uh, to go to the woods. And together they explored, they discovered as on the left that they didn't have a cell connection. They had to work with students to figure out how to put up a tent, um, but also they discovered amazing things like mushrooms they had never seen before and things they wanted to take back to class um, to, uh, to look at. And um, in this, uh, in this environment, here were some of the comments that they that they made. Uh, they were really learning how to reconnect with nature themselves. And once the teachers felt they could do that, then they felt that they could bring it back to their schools in their communities and really work to develop agency in the students by tapping into the powers that the students already had. Um, and so there are some really magical things that grew out of that uh, forest encounter. Um, and, uh, and here's another uh, one of the quotes that I didn't want to miss. They began seeing opportunities to think and work in this regenerative way um, as, they, as they went forward. And one of them said, I, he realized that regenerative learning is not adding to the curriculum, it is the curriculum and the curriculum is life itself. I'll just stop there because I could go on and on like I did in my book. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to check that out. Very powerful. Thank you. I want to give uh, some some space for Manuela to, to speak and then Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in our case, as a um, community su support organization, um, we provide what Michelle actually mentioned before, which are those two things, uh, space, time, and support. So we create the classrooms in partnership and helping the, the school to, to get the funding. The school doesn't have to have the funding, so that's part of our work. But um, we give a lot of time to the teachers. We, provide, we, we give teacher training. Um, extensive teacher training and an entire year of support so the program can be sustainable and established within the school culture. And, and we remain in partnership with schools sometimes eight years, uh, you know, as, as long as, as is needed because the time is important. And of course, uh, that goes with the, the support uh, in terms of the lessons ready um, a team of um, a curriculum specialists we have that they work hand in hand with our teachers, but also um, especially in how to manage the technology and how to manage the excitement of the kids when they enter the classroom. I love that. And it resonates a lot with our work itself as well, where we really have those long-term relationships with schools that we work with over many years and always trying to find those opportunities to fundraise you know, in, in partnership with them so they can get access to those resources. Thank you. Michelle. Um, yeah, one thing I've noticed that I feel like uh, tends to work really well is um, before, like if I do a, a kind of agile workshop, I usually ask teachers to go have a conversation with their students first, um, because student teachers do have a lot on their plate, but usually we went in because we want to make a difference. And I have a hundred percent kids first policy because that helps you to prioritize, you know, what's the most important. And so I think sometimes just is taking that step back and asking kids like you know what do you care about um what makes you angry or what's bothering you because that usually is something they care about um, but they might not express it that way yet um and then also if they feel like they have the power to do something a lot of kids will usually say no um so sometimes some of your your starting point might be in helping kids to um kind of empathize with themselves uh see what their strengths are um, and, and I think, because I think that's the thing we learn about sustainability, but don't feel confident in themselves yet. Um, they're not likely to feel empowered to take action. So for me, that's just a starting point is having a conversation with your students and seeing where they're at, because I think that'll help guide you on what you should probably do, uh, for your students where, where your starting point is. 
And I'll just kind of echo what Michelle said, if that's okay, Tara, but the, the idea that, you know, this is student, the work that we do is really student driven. So we're not asking a teacher to plot out what sustainability project they want to work on. We're asking them to, you know, pick one of our guides, which is a big theme that could do a lot of different things like biodiversity, that could mean anything um, in the natural world, and ask your students to actually investigate those things and learn about it. So we're not only asking our students what's important to them, but then we're asking them to reflect on what they're seeing in their own community and in their own natural space as well, um, and being able to integrate that new knowledge into that sort of decision making process. Um, and that, you know, for us, for on a, on a very local level, right, that's that's really that student driven approach on kind of a larger level for us who are, you know, creating Creating these guides and also kind of doing some doing professional development and supporting school districts. It's also focused on um, really making sure that things can be localized and customized based on the needs of a location. And so, you know, our, our sustainable communities guide, for instance, has been used all over the world. We've had success with students in Egypt and Argentina and here in the United States. And, um, you know, there is so, there's so much opportunity for different students to engage in the same material in really different ways. And you're going to see some themes, but overarching is that, you know, this is responsive to what our students need, but also what our communities need. Thank you. That that uh, again resonates so much. You know, in our in our program, we always start with kind of a community mapping exercise with the students to kind of understand what are those assets that they have, what are the things that they think they need, what are the issues they want to address, and then from there, you know, how do you conduct research to kind of formulate a possible solution? I love that. Um, I want to open it up to to the rest of our participants here. If anyone has a question, I surely have plenty more I can ask, but let's let's give some space for any other questions our audience has. And feel free to come off mute and ask or drop your question in the chat. Oh, here we go from Sarah Lewis for Michelle. Do you see any potential, uh, any potential specifically in climate and sustainability ed to help with the issue of polarization and helping kids connect across different perspectives and experiences, increase empathy, et cetera? Um, so I don't even know where to start with this one. So I've heard from quite a few teachers, especially science and social studies, um, this is something where, uh, for whatever reason, um, I'm in the U.S., um, I, climate is not an opinion issue, and it's being treated as one. And so depending, especially if you're in a polarized place, sometimes it's a matter of speaking with administration and helping them to understand, like, I'm an educator. Um, I My goal is for critical thinking and communication, and we're going to talk about this, not because it's an opinion, because this is, you know, you know, like virtually the entire international community has confirmed this, um, and we need to communicate that with parents. And I think, um, and when it's expressed why we're learning about things uh, to parents, sometimes we're less likely to have the backlash. So um, for me, a starting point with addressing that sometimes is making sure that uh, everyone's on the same page, so that you don't feel like you have to walk on on tipped uh, on eggshells uh, to even bring up certain issues because it shouldn't be that way when it comes to climate and sustainability. So that's where my head went first. Um, let me know if that's helpful. Um, if you're looking for something more in, specifically in the classroom, let me know. Uh, for that, I suggest games. Um, there's a lot like, um, there's, there's something called like the SDG game. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can kind of play to help people uh, our students even understand. I think sometimes um, it's not a matter of telling them, like if they look at how climate patterns have changed over decades, I actually live in Switzerland, um, have them go check out our ski resorts. Uh, anything under 2000 meters right now is really struggling and it has been for decades. Um, so they're really having to revamp their and re look at their entire ski industry. Uh, if you have older kids as well, um, insurance companies have started taking note because uh, they're gonna have to pay out now um, on the impact acts of climate. So I think instead of always having to tell them, you can just engage them in projects where there's clear evidence on how um, climate is uh, changing uh, our world and how industries are having to adapt to that. And I think when they're able to explore these things themselves, it doesn't become a polarized issue. It becomes a learning opportunity and they see for themselves the impacts. So you can find allies sometimes depending on where the concerns are coming from in the community. Sometimes churches are great allies. 
um, because of protecting God's creation and a whole host of other um, ways of thinking about this, that it's not uh, a monolithic, you know, opposition to talking about uh, climate by any means. And so you can find allies in respected institutions um, who can also be allies in the in the work. There's someone with their hand up. Yes, Elijah. Elijah, do you have a question you'd like to ask our panel? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Elijah. Uh, I have one question that I want to ask, uh, and then any, any panelists can also an, uh, answer this question. So I'm from South Sudan. So I, I, need, to, I need to understand how can we initiate uh, a sustainable development program curriculum into a regional, into regional and, 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 and country level. Because uh, we understand that uh, we, the people, we have a different uh, curriculum that uh, the people are using in the regional, uh, in entire Africa, or different with the Western world. So I need to understand because I'm also a part of the advocate, uh, education advocate for, uh, for sustainable development program. Uh, I started this program since last year and I'm trying my level base to initiate this program into the school level. And I'm getting a lot of challenging, a lot of question on how can we initiating and it's not uh, re uh, reliable with, uh, with, with a country curriculum. So this is a bit challenging to me and many, many students and also the school are asking me, the government is questioning me. So a lot of things. So I need to understand this one. I need somebody who can help me more on this. So I think anybody who need to read me, my email is there and then can also read to me and then I will deliver more about this challenge that we are facing in South Sudan in East African country. So this is my question and this is my concern. Thank you. Catherine. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Elijah, that's a that's a great question. I think it's it's one that many of us who work in systemic spaces, whether that's on a local level or on a, a national or transnational level, are are asking ourselves is like, how do we actually make this a movement and not just sort of isolated incidences of really strong sustainability education? Um, and so, you know, there are, I think, a many things that are kind of happening that can contribute to that kind of systemic approach towards this. Um, one is that student-driven work. So if students are interested in this, if student voice is being given space, um, they, they will advocate for this. Um, and, and that's something that we see over and over again. Um, and it's this is really challenging from from that sort of national level or um, you know even like local district level, um, in that some of our most progressive places um, in the world who are really thinking about climate as a government, oftentimes the education policy lags behind that national policy, um, and so we're not seeing national standards of education necessarily reflecting this need. Um, so you know as as our governments become more invested in climate action there's an opportunity for education policy to follow suit or in some cases to be a leader on that work to say this is important to our young people this so this should be important to all of us and this is what we need in order to make a difference in the future um, not just right now um, and so Elijah I'd be happy to talk to you I put my I put my email in the chat and you can email me um, whenever you like yeah, there's a lot of issues here in Africa. I'm going to share with you. Thank you very much. I got your email. Go ahead, yeah. Michelle. Um, yeah, I would be happy to be, I guess, looped in on the email and, and kind of brainstorm because um, I'm a bit unclear on exactly. Yeah, if, if, if there was an email, I'm a bit unclear on exactly um, some of the needs that you have, um, but there might be ways to connect with other organizations that are doing this. Um, I was working with somebody uh, uh, at Ashoka, Nigeria, and it seemed um, there was, uh, and I'm not sure if Sudan is a part of this, but um, there was some sort of uh, education network that was um, unifying various uh, countries in Africa. And uh, apparently, if you went through this Department of Ed kind of organization. Um, it was a bit easier to work with different universities and whatnot that were doing different things. So um, I'm not sure if this 
specific thing that I'm thinking of uh, is relevant. But anyways, um, I would be happy if you wrote an email to see if there's a way to connect dots or connect you with other people that would know more than me uh, in this space um, to see if that can be helpful. Hi, Elijah. I also dropped my email in there, hbond at howard.edu. I'm the liaison there with the Center for African Studies at Howard University. It's just one of 10 centers funded by the US government and the State Department for African Studies and Howard is the only HBCU. And so we'd love to talk with you because we're doing some sustainability work through that institute, so great. Thank you, I will email you. I got your email, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, I'm also going to drop a, a link in the chat here in a moment to an organization I know of called the Green Africa Youth Organization that we partner with in Ghana, but they have presence in other parts of the continent as well, and uh, they might be another helpful um, partner you might be able to reach out to. So thanks everyone for sharing those resources, and we're just about at the top of our hour, so do we have maybe uh, any final thoughts, reflections from our panelists that you'd like to share? or contacts, resources, anything else, feel free to drop them in the chat. And that goes for everyone. Yeah, is the chat going to be saved and distributed? Because I'm I'm having trouble saving chat here. I will defer. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. This has been so informative. I have so many more questions, so I hope I get a chance to speak with you all more and learn more from you. Um, and I know that um, there'll be many opportunities for us to collaborate going forward. So I thank you all, and thank you to our organizers for organizing this wonderful summit and looking forward to our, our final session for the day. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for so, having thank us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tara, for moderating and for all of those panelists. That was so incredible. Such creative, innovative ideas, so much inspiration for all of us. We're, we're nearing the end of our day, and I'm really excited we're ending on such a high and hopeful note. Um, and I really appreciate all of those who were able to, uh, to attend that panel, maybe some others today. Uh, we are going into our final session for the day. So thanks so much for hanging on here. It's going to be a really, really wonderful uh, closing remarks from Wendy Purcell, uh, going to be moderated by Derek. Both are members of it, our organizing committee. So it's been really wonderful to work with them and, and see them here at, at the, the uh, actual event today. We, we made it all the way to the finish line and, and now we get to see it lived out and played out with all of you joining us. So it's really wonderful. Uh, to end on this note. Um, I'm just going to give uh, a brief, brief introduction to Derek, and, and then we'll go into those closing remarks. So Derek Lowe is an SDG Publishers Compact Fellow. He fulfilled a pre-professional graduate assistantship with the Illinois Tutoring Initiative, aiding the facilitation of a grant using federal COVID-19 relief funds in support of Governor J.B. Pritzker's office, the Illinois Board of Higher Education, and the Illinois State Board of Education High Impact Tutoring Initiative. He has previously worked with Northwestern University and Johns Hopkins University at the intersection of civic engagement, education, and youth development. Prior to enrolling at Illinois State University, he volunteered as the policy director for the Young Democrats of Illinois and organized a mutual aid group in McLean County during the first 16 months of the COVID-19 pandemic. He manages fundraising for the SDG Program Fund, uh, serves as a member of the Advancing the Sustainable Development Goals Working Group for the Forum on Education Abroad, the Graduate Student Advisory Council at Illinois State University, and researching climate justice education for his doctoral studies. Thank you so much, Derek, for uh, kicking us off here. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to you now. Wonderful. I appreciate that uh, warm introduction. Um, what a full day it has been. Um, I can't wait to hear uh, Dr. Uh, Wendy Purcell's thoughts on the matter, so let me introduce her. Uh, Professor Wendy Purcell earned her PhD from University College London and was elected Fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce. She's a full professor at Rutgers University, an academic research scholar with Harvard University. Wendy's purpose lies in transforming lives through education and research in pursuit of social equity, the knowledge economy, and sustainable development. Her work focuses on sustainability and the sustainable development goals as fuel for so, uh, societal transformation and the adaptive change necessary to achieving a just transition and the creation of a world that leaves no one behind. Thank you, Wendy.
Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And uh, thank you to, to, to everyone. It's really daunting to, uh, to be asked to give the closing remarks. It's a real honor. Uh, I, I offer these comments with uh, um, humility and um, really to reflect the, uh, the generosity of all of those who shared as speakers and uh, panelists and also as very active participants. So um, I think the, the key thing I wanted to, to kind of highlight, I think, and bring into the room is, is just to kind of hold the moment really uh, that, that what we do here matters. You know, these kinds of conversations, these convenings, these gatherings, it, it really does matter. I think we've seen the amplification of our work in so many different ways across the day. And, and again, we'll see that tomorrow. Um, so just to, to kind of ground ourselves uh, when everything gets so chaotic and, and challenging and just to kind of remind ourselves that, that what we do here matters and hold that as that, that sense of purpose, really. That purpose, I think, is reflected, as we've heard from, uh, you know, the theme of the conference and why we're gathering today. But I think Anthony put it really beautifully earlier about this being a human rights and reflecting our human rights. And so I've thought through, as I've been listening really uh, intently today and thinking about how do we, you know, kind of gather up some of the ideas in, in different ways. and. Uh, Clearly, I'm not going to replay back. I just couldn't possibly replay back the kind of richness of some of the discussions. But I just kind of organised it into sort of three, three sort of thoughts, really. Um, the first was to think through our role to self-disrupt, not to be reacting to the kinds of things that are happening to us, but to self-disrupt education. I think we heard it from our uh, colleagues at ASU, you know, the complicity that we hold um, as educators in where we are now, um, but how we move forward, uh, how we, you know, maybe stop some of the discussions about sustainability versus SDGs and, you know, the arbitrary divides that, that we create, you know, so intently, but actually think about that broader sense of purpose about creating a world that that leaves no one behind that sense of stewardship of flourishing of well-being and really rethinking rethinking collectively uh education for our preferred future so we've set that future uh out or suite of futures out very carefully so a couple of things that kind of emerge really strongly just to play back and we kind of know this is silo breaking programs, ways of working, uh, taking on that kind of systems uh, focus. And really, um, we heard in one of the sessions I was doing earlier, which is a focus on solutions is maybe not um, embellishing the narrative of, of what's wrong. Uh, we know what's wrong. We've got a pretty good handle on some of the challenges, but really focusing and leaning in to that sense of uh, solution-oriented thinking. So uh, Sarah offered that to us earlier. So that's kind of one space, is embracing really wholeheartedly the self-disruption of education. And I think that we're all hearing about that in many different ways. The second kind of space that I was uh, hearing uh, that came together was around how we connect self uh, to society. Uh, and one of the things that emerged, not least if you joined us for that uh, beautiful um, kind of mindfulness session, is how we not only think about sustainability in that sense of its ES and G, environment, sort of society and governance, but actually sustaining our inner environment to, to really renew our sense of wonder uh, and nourish our inner environment. And we did that through the, the kind of mindfulness practice here, but also as a way of, of building well-being and driving up our own resilience and, and that of our students. And I think the other thing that, that emerged from, from that and from other discussions is how we hold space, how we can uh, connect and use our convening power as uh, education institutions to, to be in community, to really connect 
uh, uh, with people from very many different stakeholders and, and convene people and harness the power of, of that dialogue to plan and act together. That was a kind of second uh, kind of uh, space. And then the final, uh, the final kind of theme really to play back uh, for some of our final discussions is this sense of radical collaboration, you know, really co-creating with our students, with our community, uh, a new way of, of acting. You know, we heard uh, about the power, you know, authentic power of, of the student voice. Uh, and, and actually connecting that with the intergenerational work. I mean, looking at five generations in the workforce, six generations out there. So it's a really important work to be done there. But that collaboration is also bringing us into, I think, a deeper understanding around empathy, a more kind of entrepreneurial mindset, uh, and the way that we maybe think about a sustainability mindset. But everyone was echoing back in different ways how these are local, locally rooted, but globally connected challenges that we're working on. Uh, so that sense of harnessing this shared purpose. I mean, if you have a moment to, to engage with that kind of Parasites of the Planet video, it was inspiring, it was challenging, it was a call to action. Uh, and so whether it was baby steps or giant strides that, that people were making, I think we were looking genuinely at a, a kind of transformative education space and actually transformative values around our uh, education space. So I think in that, trying to, to sort of play back some of those, those are the kind of three themes, uh, headlines of, of today for me, but I think acknowledging uh, the adaptive challenge that we're in um, and actually recognizing fear, some of the losses uh, that come with that. But recognizing, I think that, uh, you know, convenings like that, this through the SDSN, you know, they are, hopeful spaces. They've given us all time to, to contemplate, you know, the level of the challenge. And maybe just, um, you know, if I could put it simply, remind ourselves that we're not just uh, human sort of doings. <laughs> you know, we're very much uh, human beings. And, and this is a, a human being, uh, people, planet, you know, shared prosperity space. And so I wanted to take this opportunity also just to, um, to play in some of the, the recent work we've been doing, our, a new book that we just published, which has the tagline of, you know, an agenda for transformational change, which I think fits in really well with the themes of, of uh, today's kind of conference and our gathering tomorrow. Uh, and to share with you a kind of manifesto for change that we distilled out from from those examples uh, and, and just kind of round off then and hand back to Derek. So this book, uh, our book on uh, the Bloomsbury Handbook of Sustainability in Higher Education was uh, published uh, earlier this month. And it's really sits, I think, really comfortably with the uh, sense of, of what we're doing here. So it's obviously, this focuses on universities and colleges of higher education, but I think it goes across educational sphere is recognition that, that education, 4.7 as we know, is essential for uh, catalyzing the action that we want to see, this transformative change, this just transition, this sense of this adaptive uh, challenge that we're all involved with. And from a suite of examples and case studies and, and uh, shared again, as we've heard today so generously, we distilled out a number of uh, actions that I thought might be worth uh, sharing with you and, and food for thought as we can take that into tomorrow. I think we've heard so uh, powerfully today just how important the context of where we're operating, the place in which we're operating, recognizing the heritage of our educational institutions, the culture, but those place-based assets. So that context of where we're, we're engaging and that there is often lack of translation from one geography to another, and that's okay, that's fine, we should stop trying to 
fit solutions from one place to another. That context is really important. Uh, the mission of the different institutions uh, really comes through. This isn't something we do alongside the day job. This is the day job. This isn't teaching, learning, research, innovation, civic and community work. This is all of those things and using the lens of sustainability and the sustainable development goals to look at what we do and to, to give a new lens to the work that we do. I think we've all seen and experienced how leadership can be enabling and can be inclusive and how strategy at organisational levels can really help us or indeed get in the way. Um, everybody has talked and we've heard from some fantastic students already, but that opportunity to release that energy and agency uh, and their commitment to, to betterment, you know, just comes through so powerfully. And actually, I think all of us um, recognise that sense of we need patience, we need resolve, we need to come together and you know, build our resilience as well. But this, you know, we're in this for the long haul, but, you know, time's ticking and we've got to get on with things. And I think the, um, the second uh, kind of part of that manifesto was the importance of, of communication and dialogue. Um, not only because we're, we wanted to pick up tools and frameworks and hints and tips, but actually because it nourishes us, you know, uh, in terms of our, uh, of our heart, um, of the kind of mindful activity that we had earlier and this community that, that we're building and strengthening, um, you know, for, for impact. But also I think the, uh, something that comes through very strongly and I've heard it again today is how important it is that we not only are, are inside and engaging, but we're also participating from our academic point of view and being part of the critical holding to account Showing, um, showing where there are holes, where there are issues, you know, playing back to policymakers and leaders and others, you know, what's not um, working, where things, you know, holding up our, I suppose, our critical evaluative skills and uh, that kind of reflection that we do as, as educators. And then, you know, whether it's, you know, as I say, baby steps or giant strides, you know, small initiatives uh, can really ripple, can have, can be amplified and scaled uh, in so many different ways. And I, you know, this was a, a book about higher education, but this is, you know, it, high education and what we do here really does matter. And so um, this handbook um, really talking about how sustainability changes uh, the institution, how the institution can uh, really engage and help change and be part of the change we want to see out in society working through others. So I just want to um, bring that kind of manifesto um, to you that's been distilled out from the work of a group of 65 different authors uh, across uh, a whole range of different types of institutions, different countries, and the stories and, and support of millions of students. So. Um, Thank you for, for giving me the daunting task um, to, to play back uh, to you some of those uh, closing comments and uh, uh, apologies for all the richness <laughs> that I wasn't able to capture, but I hope you found that helpful and we'll uh, leave some time for uh, questions, Derek, and reflection. Thank you. Wendy, thank you so much for taking us back through the day and uh, some of the central themes that arose from your um, expert uh, pers uh, perspective. And uh, with that in mind, um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, I'll go ahead and open up the floor if anyone would like to ask any. No questions, Eric, but I think uh, we need Wendy's <laughs> book. Um, I shared it with a couple of colleagues uh, on the phone and they're like, oh, I need to get this book. So <laughs> we are looking at sustainability and higher education and hopefully getting in the sense of, uh, um, you know, this radical collaboration that Wendy just proposed. I think it's time that uh, we all look at that radical collaboration and everyone needs to be in this together. So I just wanted to mention that. 
Thank you. I'm scribbling today. There's just, you know, three or four, 10 or 20 or more books. <laughs> um, you know, just from so much, so much learning today. I mean, I don't know if I, maybe this is just a me um, suggestion, but I just feel like, you know, my brain is full. You know, I, I hope many of you will feel the same, but my brain is full and I'm quite excited about, about uh, tomorrow as well. I've got to make some space for all of that tomorrow. I think there's a question, uh, Matt Hayden. Madeline. Hi, uh, so it was a good session today. I was just wondering, uh, are we, you know, uh, collaborating with uh, the UNESCO's uh, Internet for Trust thingy as well? Thank you. Uh, I think it's that a question for Radhika. Uh, is it the first speaker, Dr. Hillage? Uh, is that the one that you're referring to, Madhavan? Uh, this is a general question, actually, to, to all the moderators, actually. Thank you. If you can share the link of uh, your uh, the the, uh, the name you mentioned uh, about the UN Trust, I think it will be helpful for all of us to see it and then maybe reflect on it, uh, hopefully tomorrow, so that we can uh, see how we can participate. Sure thing, we'll do. Thank you. Yes, madam. if everyone wants to look in the chat and Wendy's uh, included the link to her uh, her book handbook on sustainability uh, thank you very much for taking us through that today thank you and uh, if there are no other questions um, right above that Sonia has included the um, schedule for tomorrow and uh, you're more than welcome to uh, to give us your feedback um, in the second link and uh, we I uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Radhika to close us out. Thank you, Derek. I think you said it all. Uh, we are ready to close the session. Lots of thinking to do. It's just been a fascinating day one. I think tomorrow will be super as well. We'll start with the uh, UN UNESCO overview and then going over to our topical issues along with networking. I think uh, tomorrow we'll have more time to network. So uh, feel free to Again, share ideas, see uh, how we can regionally collaborate. I think that will be wonderful because we will not get an, another opportunity to have this regional discussions. I feel that we can make those connections and see how we can uh, regionally collaborate as well. Uh, but uh, fantastic uh, day one and fantastic wrap up by Derek and Wendy. Thank you for doing, uh, for wrapping this up. And uh, so beautifully, I think lots of things to think about as we go ahead for next, uh, for tomorrow. Uh, but look forward to having all of you tomorrow and uh, having more deliberations and discussions and bringing up the three ideas that Wendy put forward to see how we can how we can deliberately include that in our agenda and uh, see what we can do with the three three ideas she mentioned. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good evening. And thanks for all the international participants who have been joining from all over at all different times. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone. Thanks. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Deepa. Bye-bye. Bye. See you tomorrow.